You're listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Not so bad. Yourself? Good. Hey, I just got back from a week of vacation. Um, I took my family to Orlando, to the land of the mouse, and uh, stood in a lot of long lines. We were supposed to be at 50% capacity. I honestly couldn't tell. It felt like the lines were longer than ever. <laughs> That's you're, you're a brave person to uh, take that that journey. Um, I know you, were, you and I were kind of talking about earlier today, and you weren't able to actually get onto a lot of the, I think, attractions because they were sold out ahead of time, right? Well, that's the, it's not even a sold out, but now it's, um, even though you have a paid park admission and you have, you know, you prepaid to go on all those attractions, uh, you have to reserve them using the app. So uh, word to the wise, if you're going to Orlando uh, for Disney and all the parks, um, download the app reserve your spot in different attractions ahead of time. That's probably a good idea. I think uh, so. I I was able to actually switching topics real quick because this is going to hopefully get me into a spot where I can go elsewhere is I finally got my first COVID shot. So I'm very excited about that. (laughs) So I'm only a couple of days into it and everything's been fine. So so good deal. Oh, and you know my story. I went to get my shot and uh, it just happened that it was right as they stopped giving the Johnson Johnson shot. And that's what they had lined up for me. So I got turned away. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess an abundance of <laughs> caution is probably good, but that's got to be disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm out there scouring work and I get my shot now. So mm-hmm. we'll see. It, it will all work out in the end. I'm sure. I'm sure it will. Um, so why don't we shift gears a little bit and maybe talk a little bit identity and access management. Um, we're going to introduce our guests in a minute, but before we get to that, some, some, some kind of, you know, odds and ends that we've got out there. Um, we still got Identiverse that's still taking place June 21st to 23rd. Uh, it's in Denver, but it's also online. I know we talked about this originally, maybe a few weeks ago, and I was like, no way I'm, am I going on site? Well, now that I'm actually have the vaccine and I'm scheduled already for my second one, right? Maybe I think, I think I've gone from 0% chance to 40% chance that I might try to attend in person. Has your thought process changed? I know, cause I know that you were kind of looking forward to it. I was looking forward to it and, you know, I've got to get at least gold status on Delta Airlines or my life is meaningless. So I've got to start traveling again soon, Jeff, soon. <laughs> so the only reason you're going is for the for, is for the mileage uh, status, huh? And the status, mainly the status. Mainly status. the status, yeah. Who cares about the identity stuff? It, I mean, you have to admit, as a, well, as, as a former road warrior, you have to admit that, you know, traveling without status of so you – you know, go on an airline to save a couple of bucks and you get treated like not as good. It, it <laughs> we'll sucks. Just leave it at that. Not as good. Yeah, no, it sucks, it right? Does. I think traveling is one of those things where it's it's hard to do at, at the very beginning because you may not have a cumulative status, but once you've got the status, it's actually not so bad, at least, you know, from my perspective. I do like to travel, but it's certainly a lot easier when you're, you know, constantly getting upgraded and you've got things like, you know, club memberships and hotel statuses. So you can kind of get late checkouts and early checkouts. And then obviously that bleeds over into, you know, personal travel, which is great too. So I certainly miss that. I, you know, I'm going to have a hard time achieving any type of status for next year based on this year. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, hopefully the, uh, the travel status gods will, will be kind and, uh, extend a little bit more. Imagine showing up at the airport and going to check a bag, and they said that'll be forty dollars. It's forty. Like, <laughs> it's like yeah. seventy or eighty now. I think at least. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's ridiculous. That's that's why I'm a, a fan of the one bag travel. So if I can get everything underneath underneath the seat in front of me, even better. So you are a fan of doodads, an evangelist of doodads, and of one bag travel. Gotcha. You got it right. Yeah, I certainly have a bag collection. That is for sure. Um, but enough about that. Why don't we talk about uh, Identity Management Day real quick? Um, that took place on April 13th, which was a Tuesday, and it will be last week uh, by the time folks are listening to this. want to give a congratulations out to Tom Malta, who was awarded the Evangelist of the Year from Navy Federal Credit Union, and then also the City of Boston, which is kind of cool, which was the winner for the Organization of the Year. Uh, always interesting to see, I think, a, a government service win 
a organization of the year for for anything because you don't really typically associate efficiency, you know, with that. But it sounds like the, they've done a great job of kind of getting the IAM space uh, into a much better position maybe than it has been. Not that I have very much familiarity with Boston, but um, I think any recognition is probably good. What do you think? Well, very big kudos to them. Uh, City of Boston, congratulations. You know that, you know, behind the scenes when the, anything like that happens, you know, there are individuals who worked, who burned the candle at both ends to make things happen. So that's fantastic. I know Tom uh, from my past in my career in identity management. He's a great person. Um, and I, I have been seeing mostly you know, recent interactions with Tom have been through LinkedIn. He's doing a great job of really um, being an evangelist, right? So that was the the award that he received, and I think it was well deserved. He's getting out there and making sure that you know people are staying up to date with what's happening in the industry. And I I think he's been doing a great job at it. So uh, very good picks, I think, and big congratulations to both. Yeah, so congrats to both winners. Maybe at some point we can try to get one or both of those guys, uh, or at least representatives from the organizations, to uh, to be on the show at some point. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about what we're going to get into today, and that'll give us a chance to introduce our guests. Our, our topic today is around the conver- uh, converged identity and access management. And to help us with that conversation, we've got Arun Singh. He's the CEO and board member at Atlantis. Welcome to the show, Arun. Thank you so much, Jim and Jeff. Uh, Thanks for having me today. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And, you know, I think one of the things that we want to get into is is really what, you know, how the market has been responding to a few different things, especially in the identity space. We've seen a lot of acquisitions. We've heard things about zero trust. We'll probably get into a bunch of different things like that. But, you know, seeing as how this is your first time on the show with us, our first question always lines up with, you know, how did you get into the identity and access management space? Is that something that you chose or did you choose it? So in my case, um, you know, it was both, actually. So when I started my career as a practice head for application security, during that time, identity and access management was pretty hot. So I chose that to start building up that practice. And um, you may not know, but um, about uh, 20 years back uh, when I was at uh, Wipro, uh, you know, we had actually created um, our own product called Wipro Web Secure which got listed in Gartner's Magic Quadrant. So there was a lot of buzz around that, the single sign-on, access management, enterprise SSO, all of that were so very popular. But later on, I moved on to look at all different aspects of cybersecurity, including identity and access management, of course. But focus was all across um, IEMs, uh, all across cybersecurity solutions. And later when I moved to Accenture as the managing director, there I built the cybersecurity managed services that was covering uh, you know, end-to-end cybersecurity solutions and identity and access management was one of the core pillar there. Same was the story at EY where I worked as a partner and there we created cybersecurity as a service offering and digital identity as a service, uh, which was my favorite uh, you know, pillar where we built that entire solution from scratch and acquired multiple customer. And very interestingly, in my current role, when I joined Islantus as the CEO, so Islantus had been focused, um, uh, you know, past uh, two decades on identity and access management. And um, this time I'll say IEM chose me, okay, to be able to, you know, come come back home. So it was kind of a full circle coming back to IEM. And uh, that's my uh, full-fledged focus right now. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting story. Um, you know, so what we want to talk about today is this trend of conver- the convergence of IAM. And, you know, I've been in, Jeff and I have both been in the IAM space for over 15 years. And you've kind of seen the industry go from sweets to best of breed and back to sweets. And, you know, you think back, you know, around 15 years ago is when Oracle started buying best of breed solutions and pulling them together into a suite. And in a way you could call that a convergence of IAM, but I think the, the trend in convergence of IAM today is about making all these parts and pieces work together seamlessly. So um, I really wanted to talk about, or have you talk about um, how, how you see this? I mean, your company kind of coined the term compact identity. Maybe you talk a little bit about what that is and, uh, you know, 
maybe key off of what I was talking about there with the convergence of IM being more than just a suite of different solutions for each of these, you know, single sign on identity governance and things and uh, privilege access management, for example. Yeah, so this is a very good question. And uh, in fact, we are so much focused on the convergence. So let me start with uh, your uh, first question that uh, why we call our product as compact identity and what is you know, the meaning of compact identity. So basically when we coined this term compact identity, uh, that time convergence um, you know, story was not that very popular. But when Islanders created uh, this product compact identity, the idea was to bring all the components of identity into a single platform and compact them together to create a compact platform. That's how we started our journey. And uh, if you look at that, why we chose to create this compact identity solution. Uh, so our experience had been, um, as you rightly mentioned, that in the beginning, it was a very simple requirement for identity and access management. People were all looking for a single sign-on solution. Then slowly the provisioning, deprovisioning came into picture. Then the role engineering came, fine-grained access management, multiple different type of authentication uh, and authorization solutions which came up like RBAC, uh, context-based uh, you know, access and um, attribute-based access management. And then very recently, this identity governance, identity administration and PAM, all of that came into picture. Now, when you look at from any customer perspective, so on an average, any client need to choose a minimum of five to seven different IEM product and then stitch them together to be able to meet the control requirement of identity and access management. Now, this approach is not just, uh, you know, brings a lot of complexity from integration perspective, but also managing so many different vendors. It, it, it's a highly cumbersome activity. So when we were looking at this market and what are the gaps, okay, we um, thought about this problem to create a platform ground up where we can converge the full suite of access management requirement, the full suite of identity governance administration requirement, and then create a platform where clients don't have to buy multiple tool and they can buy one platform. And using that, you can you know, address your IM requirement. There is another element also I'd like to highlight here is that if you look at um, you know, application onboarding onto IEM platform, so traditional approach is that we first to deploy an access management solution, whether it's a Okta, Microsoft, any solution you pick up, and then you onboard your thousands of application onto that access management platform. Then you need to repeat the same story with IGA solution. So any IGA tool you deploy and then after you do the same thing. And then the third is when you deploy the PAM solution, privileged access management solution. So again, the same story need to be repeated. It's not just time consuming, but it's also cost intensive. And that's the problem which we are solving with the help of convergence of IEM solutions onto a single platform, what we call compact identity. You know, it's really interesting because it's almost like the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing <laughs> over and over. And it's like, okay, yeah. we just went through our integration of, you know, X number of systems through our access management platform. Now we've got to do the same thing for IGA and now we've got to do the same thing for PAM. And, you know, maybe there's things that you're doing through SIM integration, right? For analytics and et cetera. So I think that's, I think it's an interesting point you bring up. Um, one of the things that you mentioned before was also this kind of as a service model. And I think there's, we've seen a lot of organizations that have, expressed a desire to move away from on-premise type solutions, right? And even if that on-premise really means virtualization, they really want to go to something as a service. So that's kind of what I was thinking is, you know, maybe we can kind of talk about, you know, what have you seen from your perspective when it comes to as a service model? Yeah, so um, as a service model has started catching a lot of momentum past uh, five, six years, and when I was working at Ernst uh, & Young as a partner, so we actually decided to build the entire cybersecurity as a service model. And the reason for building up uh, you know, as a service model was because it actually cuts down the time to deploy the solution. The time to value is one of the core driver. And a traditional um, you know, model will require you to buy the tool, you need to buy the infrastructure, deploy that, and the amount of time it takes uh, for any large organization like procurement cycle, et cetera, 
uh, to be able to deploy test and then roll it out all of that can be cut short okay because you have the base solution available in the saas model but apart from that there are two other reasons i'll um, you know mention which are very prominent which are driving this as a service model the first one is um, you know very easy upgrade and maintenance so in identity and access management you might remember that um, deploying a particular version of the product is just the starting of your journey very soon you will find the product vendor will come up with the next version and then upgrading from the old version to the new version is a full blown project it's not just changing the product but all the integrated application you need to take through this entire journey and where you need to retest all of that and that this had been a constant pain in the industry the saas model or as a service model actually takes away this major pain where product vendor as a vendor we can upgrade and bring the new version new feature functionality without um, you know breaking the entire you know continuum of integrated application onto the system so it not just lowers the operational cost but also some of those implementation failure you can avoid and also that you know the team and the talent which is required to upgrade the system all that is you know kind of you can get rid of and then uh, you know the second more most important factor which is driving as a service model adoption is you know the uh, operation from anywhere or you know you can call it as a driven by the pandemic the cloud first or mobility first kind of you know initiative where there is a you know clearly defined business need where we need to enable our employees the contractors and business associates to be able to access system from anywhere and from the cloud adoption perspective having this as a service model actually brings lot of facilities because you can bring the iem discipline to all the saas application the identity and access management you know controls can be applied to all those saas applications seamlessly and that's the you know kind of uh, main advantage why people are adapting to as a service approach i think one of the challenges that i've seen with the as a service uh, technologies that are that are out there especially if they were not originally designed for as a service is that the feature parity is not exactly there between an on-premise solution that might have been there historically versus maybe the SaaS version of that product. Um, a lot of times we see organizations that maybe have customized a lot of their on-premise solutions to meet particular business needs. And when you start to shift into the as a service model, you know, you really have to figure out, you know, how can you adjust your business processes to meet the capabilities that are actually available you know in the new versions of those products because it may not be as customizable uh, as you might be used to i'm curious as what your your thoughts are on that kind of feature parity that we've seen between different you know vendors that are out there and you know maybe they're not quite exactly the same but maybe good enough is good enough you know for now and um, you know what what your experience has been in in that specific area around features so i i think this is a very a strong observation which you have and uh, the way i would like to define it is that uh, there are two kinds of products which are there in the market the uh, some of the legacy product okay when they found that uh, cloud first strategy is being adopted by majority of clients so they actually upgraded the new feature functionality to support cloud and then there are second category of products okay which are cloud native and those are the product which were born in cloud and there's a very clear cut difference you will see as you implement those solutions that cloud native solutions they adapt to various different feature functionality and the cloud services seamlessly but where you are trying to patch on those additional features to just make it compatible with the cloud there the uh, implementation and integration poses several challenges so i would strongly recommend that um, you know uh, organizations who are looking for the as a service solution they should look at whether the product vendor is cloud native or they are trying to get onto the cloud as a aftermath yeah that that's a really good point if if it's okay i'd like to pull the discussion back to kind of the the industry vision or where the industry is heading kind of talked about that in terms of you know the convergence of IM and, and kind of where I was introducing from was you know taking that view of how the industry has gone through consolidation phases and then that created opportunities for startups to kind of fill niches and 
to specialize and, and you know, become a best of breed solution. I think that's a good backdrop for this question, which is, you know, what we just saw recently was this major purchase by Okta of the Auth0 platform and kind of building out their capabilities. Plus we see, you know, Okta kind of building out capabilities around identity governance and privilege access management. We see that with other vendors as well. I'm picking on Okta primarily or picking out Okta primarily because of the recent acquisition. I'd like to get your feedback on that. But, you know, another trend that I'm seeing is a lot of platforms like the Microsoft platform, building out identity management as a component of that Salesforce uh, service now doing kind of the same thing where they're building out their IAM capabilities and saying, hey, you can just come onto this platform and use all of our IAM tools as well. So I guess Arun to you, you know, what are your thoughts on the Okta Auth0 acquisition? And then where do you see the industry going as a whole? Is it more towards that? It, are we going to see the cycle again where we see a consolidation, but it creates opportunities for other vendors? Yeah, so these these recent market dynamics are actually proving our point, okay, which we had been actually um, you know trying to uh, bring up uh, since past many years, that uh, Converged IAM is the future of identity and access management. If you look at the recent report published by Gartner um, in December, uh, 2020, they actually published this uh, IGA market guide. There, they have very clearly uh, given the market prediction that uh, in next 24 months, by year 2023, uh, more than 45% of uh, new IEM deployment will be asking for converged IEM solution. And that's a very big statement because in the market, people are now realizing there is a fatigue. They don't want to buy those niche products separately. They want a single platform where all these solutions are baked in. And the recent acquisition by Okta, um, you know, it actually uh, kind of confirms this market trend that uh, traditionally they had been very strong in the market on access management side. But now they are seeing that, um, you know, the IGA and PAM, if they bring both of that into their portfolio, so they can address the new set of requirements which are coming in. And if you look at, um, you know, the, the approach what uh, CyberArk and many of the other IAM players, they are also taking, they are also trying to expand from their current domain, like PAM product vendors, they are trying to move into IGA and access management. Likewise, the IGA vendors, very soon you will find they will also start moving left and right, okay, to start, you know, getting into access management and uh, privileged access management, um, uh, you know, space. And one of the core point, okay, which we feel a little bit positive about it, that there are two ways by which you can actually build this conversed IEM story. One, uh, what Okta is doing, like acquiring the different product, and then you know either you do the pre-integrated uh, solution which you present to your client, or maybe you sell each of these solutions separately to the client. So from customer perspective, it will be single vendor from whom you can buy all these product. However, the way we look at it, that true convergence is where you have created a product right from the beginning. The entire code base is a single code base which is addressing the access management, IGA, and you know, PAM requirements together. And there are several advantages in doing so because you are not looking at it as a you know, three different product, but it's a tightly integrated right from the beginning. And some of those risk analytics data or identity analytics data, which you require to pass on from one tool to another tool, that all can happen seamlessly. So we still feel that um, you know, clients will look at the difference between you know the stitched converged IEM solution versus true converged IEM solution where we uh, are right now positioned as a market leader and we created this, this entire solution from you know ground up talking about um, you know the Microsoft coming onto the platform or uh, you know the other players like Salesforce um, I think those are also corroborating to the same point that uh, Convergence is, um, you know, a big trend in the market. Number one, number two, that uh, the entire space of uh, identity and access management is so very hot that many of these large packaged solution vendor, okay, they are realizing the client demand and adding more feature and functionality to be able to cater to those customer need. 
I would also like to add to your list the service now and the kind of um, you know the new feature capabilities what they are you know kind of uh, bringing onto the market. Okay, they are also um, uh, conforming to the same trend that even though it has started as an ITSM tool, but since uh, clients are putting up the request for access management, etc., why not to service that request directly? And from that perspective, they are bringing the IGA capabilities into the you know, their ITSM tool. So many of these overlapping capabilities which will be coming up in the market and they simply define two trends. One is the convergence, another that IEM is pretty hot. It's a um, you know, huge investment which people are making into this area to address this issue. And both of them are really good from you know, the IEM professional's perspective. Yeah, I think it's really interesting when you talk about the platform. Um, well, how many organizations that have ServiceNow don't also have Microsoft or you know also have Salesforce? And so, if you're making the pitch that hey, you know, pull it all together, you still have this heterogeneous environment. Unless you're a very small organization, you still have this heterogeneous environment that you need to connect. So it is uh, somewhat challenging. But I wanted to bring you back and I'll throw this out to you, Arun, but also to Jeff, is around the Okta and Auth0, the Okta Auth0 acquisition, because I just find it fascinating. I think it's going to be, um, we're going to see the impact play out over the next few years. I'm wondering, you know, I, I, you know, Jeff and I are in the consulting space, right? So we get involved with a lot of um, product evaluations with our clients and you know, product bake-offs, and it's just surprising how, or maybe not surprising, but it was just happening so much that Okta and Auth0 would be finalists kind of facing off with one another in product evaluations. They have a different story to tell, right? Okta is kind of a, you know, my perspective was it was a tool built, so, you know, from the UI, a, a system administrator kind of tool for doing identity access management, whereas Auth0 was kind of a developer tool, right? You needed to be able to go in and kind of look at the code and there were a lot of code samples that you could play with and things like that. I guess turning all that into a question is, what does Okta need to do now that it's made the Auth0 acquisition to make it successful, right? It's gotta be more than just they run as two separate products uh, forever, right? I mean, otherwise it's just, they would have been better kind of running off on their own. Uh, what, do, what do they need to do? Do you have a perspective on that or is it just sit back and wait and see? Arun, why don't you take that one first? So my feeling is, um, Jim, that okay, I would say that okay, we should wait and watch because Okta had actually acquired multiple different tools with uh, some overlap in the capabilities. So how they are going to, you know, create a you know a homogeneous solution and integrate all of them together to bring the capability for their end customer will be something which will be really interesting for us to watch also like uh, treating each of these products separately and uh, bringing the benefit um, if you add the licensing cost it goes very very high so it will be really interesting i i probably um, I would prefer to reserve my comment and see that how it shapes up in coming days uh, because it's not just Auth0, but the other very recent acquisition, what they did for IGA and the PAM. Okay, let's see how all of that plays together. I think that's a great CEO answer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the way that I would approach it is, is I don't, I, I'm not a CEO, but my two cents would be, you know, I think you have to take a look at the different markets that they've traditionally served. So Auth0, like you said, Jim, has been more developer focused. And I think Okta has been seen more as an enterprise kind of inside the firewall type tool, right, for employees. But they have been making inroads to the customer side of things. Or maybe it's outroads. I'm not sure if it's inroads if you're talking about customers in that case. <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. I think one of the things that what I would probably look at is. In the short term, nothing changes, right? They're two big companies. They're going to have to kind of navigate the different technologies and integration where it makes sense so that they don't disrupt customers of their own. But I think long term, I think this strengthens Okta's API situation and gives them a more developer focused um, capability within that regard. And then, um, you know, at some point, there's going to be a lot of overlap because they do a lot of the same things. So, you know, it is a year from now or maybe it's two years from now. 
you know, which API are you actually using? Is it an original Okta one or is it an auth zero one? And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as long as it's, you know, leveraging whatever it is you're trying to do. So um, I think it'll be interesting to see how it works out because, you know, they're certainly not the only ones making making waves in that space. I mean, Okta's just we're coming out of Octane, which was their yearly conference this year. You know, they announced PAM capabilities in the privilege access management space. They announced IGA and identity governance capabilities. Um, but a lot of that stuff isn't really coming until next year. So they made a lot of waves with announcements, but this isn't anything that's real until it hits the market. And that's not slated until I think Q1 of 2022. So we're still a ways away. Um, and it's as always the devil's in the details, right? What does that actually mean when you're saying you're doing IGA? What does it actually mean when you're doing privilege access management? Is it going to be as full featured as something like a CyberArk, which is kind of the dominant player in that space, right? So I think it'll be interesting to see how it, it works out. And I think this kind of drives towards where I wanted to take the next question, which was around investments in the IAM space, because as we see organizations start to look at different platforms, sometimes that means making an investment in that platform and divesting from existing uh, infrastructure or tools that they might already have. And I'm curious, Arun, from your perspective, I guess a couple questions, right? What are you seeing from that perspective of investing in new platforms and new tools and trying to build that converged IAM capability uh, where it makes sense? And then from a just from a market perspective, do you see any differences in the way that the U.S. has been approaching those types of scenarios versus maybe what's been taking place internationally? Yeah, so this is a standard question. And the way I would like to answer this, uh, um, that there are a couple of you know standard driver for investment in IEM space um, that uh, are universal all across the globe, like regulatory com uh, compliance and the uh, audit and compliance needs are standard across the globe. Whether you look at uh, uh, you know America's uh, U.S. has got um, industry specific regulations, and um, uh, you know same way in Europe the GDPR, the government regulation, or here in the CCP, all of that are driving. And each country has got their own regulations. So that's one of the primary driver for um, IEM investment. But apart from that, um, you know, the uh, some of the new drivers which had come up is um, like uh, digital transformation. And uh, especially in uh, American market, um, the many of the organization, um, you know, they are going through the digital transformation. And this had created a very different need for, um, you know, looking at identity and access management primarily because uh, they want to you know, handle the user experience and um, the user consent management and all those associated uh, single user uh, ID and those you know, whole lot of those uh, experiential input which they want to handle differently. That's actually driving in a big way the adoption of identity and access management. And the, you know, the other area is um, you know, the risk mitigation. And um, uh, the overall maturity of the security cannot be achieved by you know, keeping things manual or semi-automated. So without having identity and access management solution um, you know, deployed or without making this investment, you cannot get to the modern cybersecurity architecture. Uh, IEM solutions are driving you know, identity-centric analytics like behavior analytics and those kind of things which you can bring in, into the picture. And um, you know, using those identity-centric or behavior analytics, you can identify the indicators of compromise early on, and you can feed in, um, you know, more enriched information to your security operation center. And also, based on the uh, risk associated with the transaction, there are different level of authentication which you can, you know, provide. So risk mitigation is, uh, you know, big big driver, um, you know, for uh, IEM investment. Now, looking at the geographical differences, I would say in US market, digital transformation is one of the core driver apart from regulatory compliance or operational efficiency. But in EMEA market, um, uh, you know, it's um, bring your own device or mobility trend, that's also um, creating a major push uh, towards uh, adoption. And APEC market is um, primarily because of security concerns, because there had been so many different breaches which happened. So just to prevent the cyber theft, that's the core reason. And the government regulation, as I mentioned earlier, that's the driver for investment in IEM. It's interesting that you, you finished up, off with the security one uh, at driver. Um, you know, we're, we hear from, even from clients now, 
they're looking at a zero trust model. So it used to be uh, we would recommend or ask, have you looked at zero trust? Is there zero trust on your plate? I'm wondering, you know, is that a driver that you're seeing as well, where clients are actually saying, we are we are tracking towards the zero trust framework. Uh, and I'm wondering, are you designing your solutions or, or your messaging around the zero trust framework and using uh, the Converge IM as a, as a way to achieve zero trust? Yeah, of course, yes. Um, you know, on uh, zero trust is definitely pretty hot in the market. And I'll quote, um, you know, the recent survey done by Okta that itself indicates that more than 60%, uh, you know, enterprises, they are um, trying to, uh, they are working towards introducing zero trust into their environment. And in our experience also, like Islanders being a global company, when we, you know, interact with the clients in Southeast Asia or uh, Europe or in US, okay, we find that zero trust is one of the common element, okay, which people are asking about. And if you look at zero trust, um, primarily it is, you know, pushing the entire requirement, um, uh, you know, where never trust always verify model towards uh, continuous authentication. So I would say gone are the days, okay, where um, clients were happy with one-time authentication. Now they are looking for continuous authentication to be able to boost their uh, overall maturity of the cybersecurity. And if you look at, the you know core requirement of zero trust framework where people start with um, you know the creating separate zones and then identifying their high value asset into the most secure zone you require to con continuously monitor the traffic which is going in and out and who are the people who are accessing those uh, uh, you know high value critical assets and the traditional approach of having this login id password and every time you pop up and people need to log in, um, you know, uh, enter those uh, password, or if you have taken the authentic credentials first time, and then you are playing it again and again, is not going to help at all. So one of the roadblock for zero trust adoption is the password. And that's where we are actually noticing that um, there is a, you know, new trend, which is ca catching up in a big way, the password less authentication. And this is primarily, you know, bringing cryptographical techniques to be able to, uh, you know, pass on the credential and, um, you know, handle uh, it in a manner where without involving the user at the back end, you can do it in a more secure manner and then, you know, enable the organizations and the businesses to be able to deploy the zero trust uh, solution. Yeah, I was going to say, we here at the, uh, at the Identity at the Center podcast, have a strong disdain for the password. <laughs> and yep. so you're hitting on a lot of good points, but so let me put it to you like this. Finish the sentence. The password is dead, dot, dot, dot. I would say um, password is dead and it's a time for you to upgrade your identity and access management solution. I strongly recommend people to try out passwordless authentication and um, you know try it out for a pilot set of users first, see that how delighted they are in terms of their experience, and then you can roll it out for the rest of the users in your organization. That, that's, I, I think that's a great answer. You know, I, I think passwordless is one of the few technologies where you can improve the customer experience and improve security at the same time. So let me pass this one to Jeff. Jeff, the password is dead, dot, dot, dot. Again? <laughs> I've, I've been hearing the passwords dead i don't know for the last seems like five six seven years um i don't know anybody who doesn't want to kill the password but we're still stuck in this mode of uh you know organizations having not made the investment in their im platforms to be able to support that uh, or they're just starting to get into it right hardware cycles can be very long in an organization you know you may have like a three or five year laptop refresh or you know hardware refresh and Maybe people are just now getting into things like Windows Hello, right, or uh, the Touch uh, Touch ID on, on a MacBook. Um, there's always the mobile option, but there's always been hesitancy, I think, to uh, allow people to use a non-corporate device to do corporate-y type of things, right? I know BYD is out there, but sometimes maybe there isn't a, a good mobile device management plan in place. So 
Um, I guess I'll see it when I believe it. I really hope, or I'll believe it when I see it, I should say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I hope it comes sooner rather than later. It's a fantastic feature when, when you've got it enabled, you know, for your organization. Um, but yeah, I, I think let me know <laughs> when, when it actually is real in, in the majority of organizations and maybe not just, you know, the folks who are trying to be cutting edge. So um, I know we're coming up here towards the the you know our time for for this conversation, uh, but before we go, I wanted to you know one thanks so much for joining us, Arun. Um, are there any final kind of pearls of wisdom that maybe you can drop on the folks that are listening here, or or for Jim and I? So just one point I wanted to add here, like uh, the point which you mentioned regarding passwordless authentication is uh, so very true. And um, you know I have actually um, I'm publishing one paper on uh, Forbes. Uh, regarding this uh, particular point, the observations around what are the reluctance in the minds of the people. And it's uh, kind of based on my conversation with many of those clients okay, who are interested in passwordless authentication, but still thinking. So I tried compiling those thought process together. So please um, you know, look out for this uh, Forbes article, which is coming up next week uh, on uh, the same topic. No, that'd be great. Yeah. If we can, if we can get a link, we can certainly include it in the show notes so people can kind of check it out. I'm, I'm always interested to hear what the thoughts are around it because it is a no brainer, uh, until someone has to spend some money <laughs> right, to make yeah. it happen. <laughs> and, uh, hopefully that will take place sooner rather than later. Uh, Jim, any final words of wisdom for us? Yeah. Two things for me. Um, first my answer on the password is dead. It's password is dead. No, it's, it's not. But the problem is, is that a lot of the, the the core information security issues that we face will not go away until it actually is dead. So, um, you know, is it going to be five years? We're we're still laughing at the the statement the password is dead, or is there going to be a great movement toward? It? And you know, it's really on the B two C side where it's the biggest problem. It's the things that face the internet even more than it is on the corporate side. So that's that's my number one comment on this. Number two comment is really we talked a little bit about the space and we talked about um, you know evaluating IM solutions and we have the CEO on from one of the companies and I'm not saying this just the, as a service to him but just as uh, overall I think you know the the approach that most organizations take when they're evaluating IM solutions to look at like the Magic Quadrant for example and say we're just going to look at vendors in the upper right. My perspective has always been that, you know, that is a guide, guideline so you kind of can survey the space and know who's in it and who has the most complete solution. And, and all that information is valuable, but all the organizations that are kind of within that realm, even if they're in the lower left quadrant, doesn't mean they're not good solutions and that they don't fit a certain use case that, you have right all those solutions are in business because they they fit a need for some organizations right and so i would encourage folks that if they're going into the product evaluation phase that they set their their vision their field of vision as widely as possible uh to evaluate organization or evaluate im products that are maybe not in the upper right-hand quadrant. Uh, that's just the only thought is because I think if you open that field of vision, you may find something that is actually the perfect fit for your particular circumstances. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think, you know, a lot of times organizations get their blinders on, right? And they kind of follow Gartner's gospel, which, you know, they're great. They're, they're a great research firm, but they're not the end-all be-all. Um, there are really, really good products that are in the Gartner Magic Quadrant in any of them. There are also really good products that aren't rated because there is, you know, certain thresholds to, to even be considered in that in that spot kind of uh, analysis. So, um, you know, take the time to do the research. Take a look at what's actually important to your organization. What are the capabilities and services that you need and make the right choice for your organization based on you know that kind of knowledge? So I think that's a really good uh, advice, Jim. So I appreciate that. Um, so I think with that, we're going to go ahead and close it out for this week. Uh, Arun, appreciate you being part of this. Jim as well. Um, you can also you know, visit us again at the show at www.identityatthecenter.com. We're on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. You know, we're always open to LinkedIn, LinkedIn connections and messages that way. If you've got ideas for the show, you know, feel free to connect with Jim and I. Uh, Arun, I'm going to assume that you're open to connections as well on LinkedIn. Is that right? 
Yes, absolutely. Great. So I'll include your your uh, information as well in our show notes that people can check out. And then uh, with that, I uh, hope everyone uh, is staying uh, happy and healthy. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jim and Jeff. Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.